Uh, this is the second painting in our series, and this is the painting that you'll do today, uh, watching the video and then painting along. Here, it's pressing. One of my favorite ways to apply color, and we've done a lot of pressings, and uh, this is just one example of, of that. Uh, this particular painting is painted on uh, number 300 uh, illustration board. I've been looking for the right board to paint on since they uh, discontinued the 114. I've been very disappointed in the boards I've been buying and uh, have stumbled on this 300, number 300 uh, crescent illustration board and it works real well. And, uh, if, and I have bought some for us. If you, if you want to paint on the board I'm painting on, we've got some here. Uh, if you want to paint on Fabriano, there's nothing that we're doing here that you can't do on any other paper. The smoother the board, the lower the uh, tooth, the better it works. Uh, this is what we'll do next. We'll have some fun. Approaching this painting, we're looking at the colors we've got squeezed out. Uh, we have alizarin crimson, raw sienna, and burnt sienna, indigo, raw umber, and a new color, Van Dyke brown. I have black over here to uh, darkening parts of the painting. It's just a darkening agent. I don't use it as a wash. And I will be painting from the middle of the palette uh, using a lot of color this time. The brushes are in, a, in some ways incidental, but I need large brushes. The larger the brush, the more abstract you can be with it and the broader areas you can cover quickly. And I'll be wanting to cover areas quickly with this painting. So the brushes are flat brushes, a couple of round brushes for detail work. And uh, let's see, we're, we're gonna need a razor blade. Uh, that's gonna be very important. And we're gonna need our uh, spray bottle and something new. We're going to need a sheet of plexiglass. This is also a texture. That means that we're going to apply the color with something other than a brush. So we're going to apply the color with this plexiglass, which means we're going to paint on the plexiglass first, and get that abstract pattern down, and then turn the plexiglass over and press that color into the surface. And that's going to give us our initial wash in there. If you can see, I do have a drawing in here where I want the paint to go. And so I'm ready to start. I'm just thinking, make sure that this is the exact movement that I want with my paint. And to make sure that I put the pigment exactly where I want it to go, I'm registering the plexiglass in the lower right hand corner of the paper on the edge to the right and at the bottom to the right and I'm coming in now with a marker and marking on the plexiglass where I want the color to be placed in You don't have to be careful with this drawing. It's just areas. It's not detail. It's just areas. I'll be looking for the paint to move in a direction almost like a rock quarry, looking for the paint to kind of move in this direction, even mimicking somewhat a landslide. There's another little section over here. And I'm going to, uh, I, I, have, I have more over here that I have to do. The plexiglass is not wide enough. So I'll just paint on this section and then I'll do a whole new press over here for that section of the painting over there. So I'm ready to put the paint on. It's important. Once I block this in that I turn the plexiglass over and paint on the backside because I'm now working in reverse. If I don't do that, if I paint on the side that I drew on and then put the paint down, it's gonna be on the other side of the paper. So the register is very important right here. I 
Okay, the outline of the broad areas where we want to concentrate our color are finished. In order to make sure that we get everything in the right place, we've got to paint on the back of the plexiglass, not on the front, uh, because we're going to flip it over to, uh, to press the paint down. So we are going to turn it over and put our color in reverse. I don't want to be confused with the drawing that's underneath, so I'm going to take a white board so that I don't see the drawing underneath, and I'll start putting my color down in these areas using the broad brush, the flat brush, and going with my earth tones, like the raw umber, the raw sienna, the Van Dyke brown, all of those colors are on the brush at the same time, including a little bit of uh, dark black in there. To do this project, you'll need to be very careful to get a lot of paint down here, a lot of paint <clears throat> with a little bit of water, just enough. If you were to look into this, you would see thick pigment on there, not water, but thick pigment. I have a little bit too much water in my brush. I'm going to drag some of that out of there because I would like to get that sort of dry brush effect also going on in there. Van Dyke Brown, I want to get some of that in there. And this part of the painting must go quickly also. You don't want this paint to dry. Just a touch of water. All right, that's good. Now let's dry a lot of water out of that brush by squeezing it at the base and then just drag. Oh, that's good. Yeah. All right, let's see what that does. I'm just spraying a little bit in there just to keep that paint moist not lose anything. You get one shot at this, so I just want to get a little bit of dark right back in there and maybe right in there. Now let's remove the white paper, forward, turn this over, hit our register mark, and lay this down. Now we want to press that into the paper. Here we're applying color with a piece of plexiglass. That becomes a, a texture. If we apply color with a brush, that becomes a wash. Just in our explanation of things, we're, we're looking at either textures or washes when we lay the color down, um, uh, brush strokes or something else. All right, we want to lift this plexiglass off. We want to lift it in a direction so that we get a movement of uh, fall as, as the paint moves in this direction you get a little bit of static electricity built up under here and that all works to our advantage as we pick this up and then move this way. Now that's a good press. Now we are not through. We go down now in here with the razor blade and we start converting this block of color, a mass of color, into specific shapes that look like boulders and, and uh, crevices in the rock. So I'm going to pick up the razor blade, make sure that I have it wet. And if we can come in close, we want to watch and see what happens. Now I'm concentrating to create these to rocks. I'm thinking of the 
the top of the rocks catching light. So when I begin my scraping here, it's going to be the tops of the rocks that I'll, I'll scrape. You'll notice that by moving these colors together with the razor blade, it grays them out quite a bit. So you get that nice gray look in there simply because you're mixing those colors together. And the razor blade is, is making the colors mix. A lot fresher when your paints are mixed here than when they're mixed over there. beginning to dry on me so we'll just wet that down just a little bit. I can actually pick up color from here, scraping it. Now the color is on the edge of the razor blade and use it in another part of the painting just to get a, a nice movement of color coming back across that I might not have got a, gotten a, uh, a good deposit in there. Just picking up paint from this side and moving it to the other side, moving it around, keeping it angular and sharp so that it looks like rocks and feels like rocks. All right, good. We'll stop there and we'll do a second press on this side of the painting. Okay, we've cleaned the plexiglass off with water, dried it off, and we're ready to make our second press. We've moved the plexiglass over to the left-hand side of the paper where we're now using the bottom and the left side margin as our register. And we'll sketch in our new area. So we're looking to paint in this area here, through here, through here. Through here. And all back down in here. Good. There'll be some small little areas that I'll try to trash up a little bit to keep it from being too clean 
but this looks like that's going to work fine. So this is our next pattern, and I'll turn this over, get my whiteboard out so I don't look underneath and get influenced by what is already there. And we're ready to fill in these spaces. A little bit of water, a lot of paint. And it wouldn't help if this passage or this deposit of color wasn't darker than the other. It is a little bit closer to us. It's a foreground, so if it gets a little bit darker, that's going to be okay. In, in doing this exercise, and you're just blocking in color, uh, try to think yourself as painting here as well, not just laying some color down to press in whatever kind of really nice aesthetic movement and darks and lights and colors you can get in here, the better your press is going to be. So it's not just a very haphazard thing, there's a lot of purpose in this. It leads to the beauty when this part works that we have up here. All right, now let's, let's see what that gives us. Normally, I'll just give it a couple of mists to make sure that the paint doesn't dry on me. Move the white out of the way. I'm thinking to myself, yes, that's what I want. Back to the razor blade to give this the same character that we have over here of, of rocks. And because it's closer, maybe much larger, more massive rock formations, And by dragging, not pressing too much with the razor blade, but just by dragging, I can bring some color and taking the end of the razor blade and actually draw a line with that, give me some nice crevices and cracks in the rocks.
All right. Let's stop and dry this off completely, and then I'm going to come back in with some deep darks just to pull a little power in here, darks that didn't go down with my plexiglass, and this is not unusual because you have no idea what the plexiglass is going to do till you press it in. I like the, the textured effects, the grainy look that we have in there. What I want to do with the darks is to strengthen the contrast between the white and the color. Right now, it's a white against a middle tone, and I'd rather it be a white against a dark tone, white against a dark tone. That will work out better for me. I just love high contrast, and there's going to be high contrast in this part of the painting, so I want it down here as well, too. That's where we're going next, and we're going to use a brush to do that with, so uh, let's, take a, let's take a break and get this completely dry. So far, what we've, what we've done is we've blocked in the local color and we've developed lights, developing lights in that press. The press was the local color of the painting. The lights are where we've defined those with the razor blade. The third stage of the painting is uh, to add your deep dark, to strengthen the things that are down here. Some of the darks already work very well. Most of them we've lost in the scraping. So I want to go back through the entire painting now and establish the darks and create a higher contrast in the light and dark areas, much like what we have up here. So in looking at this, it's a matter of finding where the rock begins and ends, making a determination. It doesn't matter where that is. That's an independent decision of yours. I might look at an area and see five rocks. You might look in an area and see ten rocks. It's just how you see the shape and form is all that matters at this point. But I notice that it's kind of vague all through here. So I'm going to try to find a, an opportunity to create a dark shape in there which gives me a separation from here to there and makes this into a, a, a more specific or a, or a stronger rock shape just simply by the darks that are in there. And they don't have to be done too much, just a little bit to create the uh, power of uh, dark and light. Paying attention to the tops of the rocks being lighter and then the shadow patterns on the rocks being darker. And right away I'm beginning to see a lot more in this area right in here. And I'm alternating between the flat brush and the round brush. And we'll find also, if we're getting in there real close, an opportunity for crevices, some line work in there. And I want to emphasize here very strongly that there's no, there's no pattern. I'm seeing this a certain way. If you were doing this painting, you would see it different. But that's what you do. You follow your own, uh, your own vision. Uh, uh, there's any number of ways that these can be interpreted. I know what I see. And that's where I'm applying these darks, where I need them.
I especially want a deep dark right there where the white hits that area. Very strong contrast in there. Now see if I darken behind that shape on up from there, it pushes these forward. And then we come out with a, a nice description of foreground and middle ground and background.
uh, coming back coming back to this and looking at it after I've been playing with the darks, I'm still not satisfied with what's going on in here, and I really need something a lot more powerful. This entire painting is about contrast, and I see so much little subtle stuff that um, in little bitty pockets of it, it works, but when you look at the whole thing, it doesn't work. So I'm feeling like we need to make a much broader statement of darks in here and paint over what's there and let this shine through underneath the dark and create a much, much darker uh, uh, area. That's my motivation at this point, so that's what I'm going to do. And I've mixed up a nice dark in my palette, and uh, this is uh, where the painting needs to go. All right, so with the, a dark wash over everything, and moving the wash in a direction that we want the entire painting to go, which would be in this downward motion here. Um, I can kill a lot of the individual rocks there and create a more universal dark through the whole painting. That's what I want to do. And what will happen is that these other structures under there will glow through this movement that we're putting on there now. And I'm much more pleased with the way this is working. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move down here and I'm going to work through this area as well too with the same theory and that is just darken it. <clears throat> the colors are still going to show through because it's transparent watercolor. But notice how that makes it one large shape instead of a bunch of small shapes, and that makes me feel better about this. Yes, yes, yes. All right, now let's come over here on this side and work up from this nice light shape here. Preserve the tops, and that becomes a more of a solid rock shape in there. And let me just look here. Let me go right back through here and up through there. And then in this area down here. I'm a lot happier with that now than I was before. Uh, and since this is drying and we don't have to wait, none of the sky touches this. I'm going to go back in there and put my sky in back in there and paint around these buildings. And then we'll see what that looks like. We'll take the tape off. We may be through. Who knows? All right, and we're ready.
I put my finger down in the sky a couple of times. All right, let's uh, darken just a little bit more. All right, let's see where we are. Like that. I'm going to declare this unfinished. I've oh, got to do one thing. As I mentioned earlier, a painting will take its, a life of its own, and it will it'll demand things. It will say to you, I need to be finished, or I am finished, or leave me alone, things like that. And this one's just saying, uh, you got to fix me, so I need to fix. And what I think I have here is, is a nice design a good composition, leaning a little bit more toward representational qualities rather than flat design qualities, and I started with the intention of flat design quality. So I think to finish it I need to do a little bit more representational stuff in here, which means snow shadows. That'll give us, the white spaces now are flat, they don't have any push or pull, any depth to them. We add uh, the shadows to them, they'll start having a fullness and a thickness. So let's start back up here on the roof line where we get just a little bit of snow packed up over there and then also some snow along the horizon. Just a brush stroke or so. Now we're going to come back here where the snow gets really thick where the rocks are. And because we have such a dark sky, it's going to look like a midnight snow. That might be a nice uh, flavor for this painting. So coming back. Then thinking about some line work in there as well, too. <clears throat> In putting these shadows, I'm aware that whatever light there is, that the snow is lighter at the top. And as it turns away from the light, you get a bit of a shadow there. Whether it's moonlight or sunlight, it doesn't matter. There's going to be a glistening there, and a light and a dark. I, I like that. So here's...
in areas that are more congested. All the press here it traps the snow a little bit more. The shadows aren't as big and broad. They're a little bit more spotty. This can be fun too, just trying to figure out where the shadows are and just playing with it. Uh, 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 problems in here for me, uh, now I'm having a lot more fun because I really believe that this is working the way I want it to. Um, that always excites me that uh, you don't want to you know, continue with a painting that has no possibilities ever of, of working. But then it's fun sometimes. Most of the demonstrations that you see where an artist will demonstrate a painting, they demonstrate the ones that work perfectly. Here we have one that didn't work perfectly. That's good, I think that's been a good lesson for all of us to see. What do you do when it doesn't work? Uh, back up, come up with another idea. We've mentioned in class a lot about how much more you learn from your failures than you do your successes. Because you have to really reach in real deep when, you, when something goes wrong to figure out what went wrong and then how to correct it. And that's what we had here. Now one final touch, we're going to get some opaque white, some tempera white. We're going to just put a little bit of snow on top of these rocks in, in different places, not all through the, the whole painting, but just in different places, just to give a little bit of the white inside these areas that are beginning to be uh, cluttered up with, uh, with darks. I want all of the water out of my brush.
and be just as abstract with this if you have been with the rest of the painting, just texture, not a lot. Now let's put the mat back on it and see if we like it any better than we did when we put the mat on it the first time. I like it much better. I think that was the right thing to do. Um, probably a little bit darker. under here. Okay, I'm going to say that's done. <clears throat> 